Good evening. Welcome to Midweek Bible Class. It's really good to see you all here tonight. Just want to go over a few announcements, as is our custom here, uh, before we have an invitation. And uh, the song we've got is number 311. That's what we'll sing after the invitation. And Cole Nerland will dismiss us in prayer in just a few moments. Uh, as you look over the exhorter bulletin on the back page, uh, just a few that are highlighted here. Um, you know, good, good news at the very top of the list that Paul uh, and Anna, formerly Lee now, got married, Paul and Anna Guzman. So we're, we're very thrilled that happened uh, this last weekend. Uh, and, and so we, we rejoice when there's good news like that. Um, and, and then some dates coming up. We just want to be mindful that April is a big month for a lot of people. Uh, Jerrica has got her, her uh, surgery uh, for breast cancer. Amanda Nelson and Janet Nelson both have... Um, something medical coming up, a, a heart stress test for Amanda, and um, tubes placed in the ears for Janet. So um, April's kind of a big month for a lot of people medically, so let's just be aware of who we need to be praying for as those dates are approaching. And, and of course, we're getting close now. It's almost April, so we want to start uh, mentioning as often as we can that our singing is at the end of April, Friday the 26th. So uh, be inviting as many people as you can. It's going to be a really good night. Put that on your calendar. Do the elders have anything else we need to bring to the attention of the church? All right. I'd invite you to open to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians is an easy place for me to go for an invitation because I'm teaching Philippians uh, Sunday morning in, in the classroom back there. And so that's where my mind is at right now is in Paul's prison letters. And in Philippians, he talks about in chapter 1, this idea of looking forward to heaven. Do you look forward? We all look forward to something. What is it that you're looking forward to next? Uh, could be a movie. I'm a movie guy. I always like to look ahead on, on the calendar and see what movies are coming out when, when we get to a new month and what to look forward to. And uh, Last year was, was kind of a dud year for movies, but this year there's some I'm kind of excited about. So I got things to look forward to uh, when it comes to my property. It's spring, so uh, trees are starting to put out buds and leaves, and pretty soon there'll be fruit, and I'm excited for all the stone fruit, the pluots and the nectarines especially. Uh, so it's something to look forward to. Last week in Texas... You guys know I was there for a gospel meeting uh, with the church I, I worked with for one year, about four or five years ago, and I have been looking forward to going to Black's Barbecue uh, for about three and a half years since the last time I was there in Texas. Uh, there's some decent barbecue out here, but for whatever reason, you guys here are obsessed with tri-tip, and I don't get it. Brisket is clearly the superior meat, and in Texas, that's... That is the, the epicenter of delicious smoked brisket. So I was really looking forward to that. When you have something you're looking forward to, it can be discouraging when you have to wait for it. But you have to be disciplined and you have to, uh, you have to keep reminding yourself that it's worth the wait. And also, you have to take some steps to prepare yourself. With the fruit trees, I had Mike Moon come out and help me prune them earlier this year so they'd be the most fruitful and productive. I had to do some work to prepare for the thing I'm anticipating. And when it comes to Black's Barbecue, I skipped breakfast and lunch that morning so I could really get, if I'm not going to be back there for who knows when, I wanted to get my fill. So when there's something you're looking forward to, you have to be strong and disciplined and remind yourself it'll be worth it and keep going and you have to make preparations for it with paul he talks about in a prison cell philippians chapter 1 and verse 19 for i know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and supply of the spirit of jesus christ according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing i shall be ashamed but with all boldness as always so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, that will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose I cannot tell, for I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. Paul would talk about heaven often is the thing that he looks for, the, the prize at the end of the race, so to speak, the goal, the thing that he is striving for and 
step after step. So he talks about his discipline. He is not giving up. In 2 Timothy, he would write, which is probably the last letter we have before he died, he would write about how he had run the course and finished the race, that he did not give up because he knew the prize was worth it. And we know that there are preparations that we have to take. So when it comes to heaven, it's, this, it's that concept. Do you look forward to it? Are you eager about heaven? Well, understand that like Paul, we might rightly say, I would love to depart and be with Christ. That would be so much better. But look, I, I've got kids and I want to be here for them. And, and I have people that I want to teach the gospel and I have things that I need to do. So I want to go and be with Christ, but I know I have to wait for it but it'll be worth the wait. It'll be worth whatever I go through. So if you're here tonight and you're running the race and you're in the middle of it and you're discouraged, don't give up. And if we can pray with you and encourage you and you need some help from us, please let us know. And if you're here tonight and you want heaven as your prize and you want that fellowship with God for all eternity and you know that it'll be worth everything, then won't you give your life to Christ? Make the right preparations in order to take that prize at the end of your life's race. If you need to put on Christ in baptism, we'd love to help you with that and invite you to come forward now as we stand and sing. While we pray and while we plead, while you see your soul's deep need, while your Father calls you home, will you not, dear sinner, come? Why not now? Why not now? Why not come to Jesus now? Why not now? Why not now? Why not come to Jesus now? Come to Christ, confession make. Come to Christ and pardon take. Trust in Him from day to day. He will keep you all the way. Why not now? Why not now? Why not come to Jesus now? Why not now? Why not now? Why not come to Jesus now? Let's pray. Dear Most Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day you've blessed us with. We also ask that you help us apply what we learn today in our daily lives. And we ask that you help us be a shining light and always be the good example, whether it be at work, school, or just in public. Um, most of all, Lord, we thank you for your son Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. We say all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
have this tonight. So we're good. All right, let's all turn to Exodus chapter 15. Last week in Exodus chapter 15, we saw the Egyptians were dead on the seashore. And as a result of that, they sang a song. And in looking at that song, it was a song that would remind the Israelites what God had done. But it also would remind God about who God is. And that's the thing we tried to emphasize last week. Uh, if we talk about the identity of Jehovah, Jehovah is my God and my Father's God. The Lord is His name. There isn't anybody like Him. He has a place for His people. They are headed toward that land. And the Lord reigns forever. We emphasize this idea of the song teaches them who Jehovah is. We also notice the prophetess Miriam. How did she become a prophetess? God made her that way. Uh, I'm assuming she became a prophetess just like every other prophet, uh, by inspiration of God. Now, one thing we want to remember about Miriam is that she is often overlooked. Uh, in Micah 6 and verse 4, we remember the prophet Micah said, God sent them Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. And that would indicate that there was an important work that she was looked upon as doing. She was not a totally inconsequential person. Now we also said last week that when we get into the 16th chapter, for us it marks the beginning of Israel being Israel. Uh, and what we mean by that is we're going to start really noticing some of the traits that stigmatize the nation of Israel. And when we think of Israel being Israel, what is their distinctive behavior that we see over and over again? They gripe. We're going to do our best not to lose that list which was provided for us last week. Uh, this is just a recording of the number of times the children of Israel uh, found something to complain about. In chapter 15 and verse 25, they came to the waters of Merah. There was no water to drink. Let me just write water here. I want to notice a little something about it before the night is over. The water is bitter. God fixes it. Throw a tree into the water and you'll be able to drink it. Now, I do not believe there was anything mystical about that tree. That's just... That's like Jesus says to the blind man, we're going to put some mud on your eyes. It's just to show that uh, this is in connection with God. So he makes the water drinkable, but he makes a statute and a regulation. And we kind of went over this quickly at the end last week, but I think it's kind of important to get it in our minds. In the 15th chapter, when you come to the end, he makes a statute and a regulation. Does it say anything specific? The statute is don't do this. The statute is we're going to do this. Is it specified? Or is it generic? Very generic. It's if you do what God says, you will prosper. God will be good to you. Is that about as generic and basic as it gets? As we are starting the exodus, as we are just going forward in this, uh, when they first begin to complain, God throws out this very generic idea. If you do what's good, if you obey God, you're going to prosper. Now that was true back then. Does it continue to be true today? Sermon on the Mount. Uh, the one who listens to the word of Jesus is like somebody building their house upon the rock. Now, I want us to make a mental note before we go on. Think about the grumbling of Israel and think about their complaining. Okay, don't raise your hand. Is there anybody in this assembly here at the moment that knows they complain a little bit too much and grumble? Don't point fingers. 
you'll get me in trouble. <laughs> Anybody here, does your conscience convict you and say, in my heart I know that I am a grumbler and a complainer? If such is the case, I want us to really think about the next few chapters in Exodus. Uh, when Israel starts griping and grumbling, in the very beginning, when Pharaoh increased their workload and they complained, do we kind of understand that? Have a little sympathy for them? Because after all, they didn't know much about God at that time. This is brand new stuff. They hadn't seen anything. And so we can, you know, we can kind of let that go a little bit. But then they see God striking the Egyptians with plagues. And we start understanding their complaining a little bit less. Now, by the time we get here to the waters of Merah, after all they have seen, is that kind of stretching our patience a little bit when we see that grumbling? It's hard to put up with grumbling in other people, isn't it? Much easier when I do it myself. If there's going to be grumbling, I need to be the one to do it, because I can put up with that. Now, a lot of grumbling, and right here in the beginning, in the 15th chapter, God jumps right on that and says, okay, here's my point. You need to obey. You're sitting there complaining. Here's the basic principle. If you do what I say, it's going to go really well for you. And with that, with that principle in mind, we go forward. And this is a statement that, you know, about grumblers. God says, when they grumble, here's what you need to do. You need to obey me. Is grumbling disobedience? Okay, we'll throw this out there. And let your mind think about it. Show me a grumbler and I'll show you somebody who's one step away from being a rebel. We'll say it again. Show me a grumbler and I'll show you somebody who's one step away from being a rebel. And we get into chapter 16. Now, we have griped about water. Now what are we going to gripe about? Now we are going to gripe about food. Water and food. What could possibly be more basic than those two things? Exodus 16 verses 1 through 7. Jimmy, would you read that? Okay, we're back to grumbling again. Now, how long have they been out of Egypt? They left Egypt, first month, 14th day, and now we're up to what? Second month, 15th day, is it? So they have been on the road now for a good, solid month. Well, a month, that's a long time to be good, isn't it? If I can manage to be good for a month, I think I'm doing pretty well. 
But when you read it on a page like this, you realize, no, that's not quite the way it is. In the third verse, the complaint, the sons of Israel said to them, would that we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt when we sat by the pots of meat, when we ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Now I'm thinking, I could work Black's Barbecue of San Antonio into this somehow. If Kyle was sitting there, we'd find a way to do it for fun. You ever notice that some things in your memory were probably a lot better than when you were actually there? Sometimes not, but sometimes are. Now, I think their minds might be exaggerating a little bit. They come with this complaint. Now, when you look at that third verse, if we put it in our vernacular and summed, summed up what they're saying, what is it? I'm so hungry. I'm so hungry, I wish I was dead. Isn't that something? I am so hungry, I wish I was dead. Uh, you know, boy, I mean, you would have been better off if we had died in this wilderness. You brought us out here to kill us with hunger. Would we have died in the land of Egypt? We're so hungry, we wish we were dead. Now, that is a complaint to the ultimate extreme. Now, if I were to say something like, I am so lonely, I wish I was dead. I am so poor, I wish I was dead. I am so ugly, I wish I was dead. Would you assume that I really meant it? Now, do we live in a society where if you talk about suicide, that is an issue in this day and age? Uh, and sometimes it almost seems like a fad and it, thought occurred to me this week. I wish I'd have written down everything I thought of. It's amazing the things that become fads. That you think they're the worst problem that mankind has ever faced. And two years later you don't hear about it anymore. Because there's a new worst problem that mankind ever faced. Uh, but we come up with this. Boy I'm so lonely I wish I was dead. Uh, so ugly I wish I was dead. Do we really mean it? What do we mean when we say something like that? I wish I had something different and better that I like. I don't wish I was dead. I just wish I had something different. And in your experience, is this not usually manipulative behavior? And what do I mean by manipulative behavior? Somebody explain manipulative behavior. I am trying to push somebody in the direction I want them to go. Get a reaction from somebody else. In the third verse, who are they blaming really in the third verse? He says, or they say, you have brought us out into this land. It's you. And since you did it, you need to feel bad. You need to fix it. You need to help. Okay, your experience. When somebody comes to you talking like this about how terrible they feel and what a lousy situation they're in and you're the reason they're there, they come to you speaking this way. Do, does it not occur to us, you're just trying to get what you want out of me? Isn't that usually what it is? You want me to feel bad enough to do what you want me to do. Now, we understand this when somebody's doing it to us. Do we ever do it to other people? Do we make excuses for doing other people that way? Pushing somebody, oh, and if you tell me you've never done this, I'll 
tell you to check your memory banks, whether with your wife or your brother, your sister, your mom and dad. Well, I'm this, this, and this, and my life is miserable, and it's your fault. And you put it on them. Because we want something. And we make excuses for this kind of thing. Um, I was upset. I was just spewing. That's my favorite. I was just spewing. Or I was just unloading. We make excuses. But essentially what we are doing at times like this, we try to take what we perceive as a great problem, put it on someone else, say it's your fault, and guilt them into doing what we want them to do. And then we make excuses. Now look at verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether or not they will walk in my instruction. Okay. Back in chapter 15 and verse 26, God gave the general principle. What's the general principle? Going to make a regulation and a test. Do what I say, it's going to go really well for you. Now we have a specific. Here's a test. We're going to take that general principle, we're going to make it specific, and it's going to relate to food. Now, what are the basic instructions God gives concerning the bread that's going to fall from heaven? Gather an omer of it for everybody in your household. On the sixth day, gather twice as much. Does he tell them right up front that on the seventh day it's not going to fall? No, he says gather five days, gather twice as much on the sixth day. Yes. Yes, it is. Kind of unspoken. I mean, does he go into great detail in explaining that up front? Or is, he, or is he just asking them to trust? Do what I say, and it's going to turn out well for you. It's out there. I want to think about this idea of a test for a second. Now, is he doing this because he wants them to stumble? No. But if you're a teacher, one thing you realize, sometimes handing out a test is one of the best ways to teach somebody something. Because it's at that point they realize, wait a minute, something is lacking here. God gives them instruction concerning the food. Uh, it's a blessing and a test. And that really is not hard to comprehend, a blessing and a test. Uh, and the reason it's a test, you know, you stop and think about this. Uh, those who raised Kids, did you ever have confrontations with your children over what they were going to eat? Did that ever happen? What will my kids eat? Eat your peas. Try the peach. We, <laughs> we had it out with our oldest son over a peach in Oklahoma when he was about sitting in a high chair. It was incredible how stubborn a little kid can be when he doesn't want to try something. Uh, but there are confrontations concerning food. We all understand that. You know, use your fork, learn to do this, learn to do that. Well, we got a test here with a group of adults and it's all about food and whether they can follow simple instructions. Now, this is a blessing God has given them, but it's also a test. Now, expand that a little bit. Can any blessing be seen as a test? For instance, God blesses me with success in business. Is that also a test? In what way? God blesses me with success in business, but it's a test. What is the test? What I'm going to do with it? Anything else I could add to it? 
Will I let it go to my head? Will I let it change me? Okay, how about uh, God blesses me? And I've been looking for a good job for a long time. And lo and behold, it falls right into my lap. I have the job that I was dreaming of forever. That's a blessing. Is it a test? How? I don't take it for granted. But is there always the temptation to try to serve two, two masters? That's always there. Um, children. Children are a blessing from God. And blessed is a guy with a quiver full of them. Are children a blessing and a test? What's the test part? No, not that you might kill them. That isn't it. What? Yeah. Will you lead them in the right path? Will they have an infinite influence upon you? Uh, these are all things. Will you be responsible with your own children? Responsible behavior. Do we, we understand the concept of responsible behavior? Responsible behavior toward children is what? Uh, teaching them right and wrong, educating them what God wants them to do, pointing them in the right direction. They're a blessing, but that part's a test. School, you go to school. Is it a blessing to be able to go to school? Somebody might argue that. But is is it a test? School system of America might be one of the greatest tests uh, considering the system that we have. Uh, any blessing can be looked upon as a test. They are complaining about food. God says, okay, we're going to have a test. General rule, do what I say. Here's what I want you to do. Man has fallen from the sky. You pick it up. Five days a week, six days, you pick up twice as much. That's going to be the test. But I want to look at verses 8 through 12. Robert, would you read that, please? Twelve. Okay, back up to verse 8 for a second. Moses said, This will happen when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and bread to the full in the morning. For the Lord hears your grumblings which you grumble against him. And what are we? Your grumblings are not against us, but the Lord. Your grumbling is not against us, but the Lord. This is a not but clause. They were actually murmuring against Moses and Aaron, but really it's against God. That's the way God sees it. Because essentially they are saying God has failed us. Now, try to write something out here. Okay, let me... You're going to fill in the blank. All right. My life... And I'm going to put the word stinks because it's quick. My life stinks. I wish... I wish I was dead. 
all hopeless, boring. Boring is a big complaint anymore. All right, picture somebody saying all this. If you had to fill in that blank, who's the person that's causing that? My life stinks because of you. Who's the you? You got somebody you'd put in there? And complain, complain, complain. We see it as grumbling against a person. How does God see it? At least sometimes. Sometimes there are legitimate complaints. But if I'm just a grumbler, God sees it as you're putting who in the blank? You ever stop to think about that? Or I'm, I'm randomly picking out people. Nobody did anything. So don't think anything about it. Robert, you're the reason my life stinks. Jimmy, you're the reason my life stinks. Jay, you're the reason my... I'm not going to point at Murphy, and I'm not going to do that at all. Because the truth is, my life does not. Anybody here want to make me wish I was dead? Bob, you make me wish I was dead. Okay, hopeless, hopeless situation. All of this, we make these complaints. Why would God ever take that personally? I mean, I'm grumbling against you. Why would God take that personally? Oh, Scott, you don't like the life I've given you? I haven't been that good to you, you think? You think you got it really tough? Like Jonah, doest thou well to be angry? Realistically. Everybody's got problems. And they're tough problems. But, yes, Are we, yeah, yeah. If it's short-sighted, it means we're probably really overlooking something. I mean, there's something there. Yeah, it's a nuisance, but I am overlooking something. What were the Israelites overlooking? God just wiped out their enemies, brought them to freedom, was taking them toward the promised land, had just proven he could give them, give them water anytime he needed to. All of this. Now, relate this to ourselves. My life stinks. I wish I was dead. It's hopeless. It's boring. It's your fault. And God in heaven could look down and say, Oh, you don't like your life. What is my life compared to other people in this world? Pardon me? Yes, it is. Um, kind of grew out of my clothes, but did I have clothes to wear? Sort of. I got to do something about that. Roof over my head? Well, if I grew out of my clothes, am I eating well? I was. Good family? Good brethren? What do I have to complain about? 
if somebody objectively looked at me and say that person lives in Zimbabwe right now, what would he say? He would say, I will trade you sight unseen. Matter of fact, I don't have to know anything about your life. If you're living in America and I'm living in Zimbabwe, I will trade you sight unseen because you're living in America and I'm living in Zimbabwe. Yeah, yeah there are times when, when uh, complaints against people are legitimate and have to be dealt with. But if I'm the type that my whole frame of mind gets sour and twisted because all these things, blah, 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 and it's your fault. There may be a God in heaven looking at me and saying, huh, you're not happy with this life, huh? Sometimes it might do us good to be shown what bad is. So that we would know the difference. Now if we really want to spend our time griping and groaning. Let's remember verse 8. Moses said this will happen when the Lord gives you meat in the evening. And bread to the full in the morning. For the Lord hears your grumblings which you grumble against him. And what are we? Your grumblings are not against us. But against the Lord. All right, 13 through 21. The test comes. So it came about at evening that the quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew evaporated, behold, on the surface of the wilderness, there was a fine flake-like thing, fine as the frost on the ground. When the sons of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it every man as much as he should eat. You shall take an omer apiece according to the number of persons each has in his tent. The sons of Israel did so, and some gathered much and some little. When they measured it with an omer, he who had gathered much had no excess, and he who had gathered little had no lack. Every man gathered as much as he should eat. Moses said to them, Let no man leave any of it until morning. But they did not listen to Moses, and some left part of it until morning, and it bred worms and became foul, and Moses was angry with them. How'd they do on the test? A real simple test. And they failed. Pick up an omer apiece. Uh, don't leave it till the morning. And they failed. Now, second part of the test. 22 through 27. Uh, Joe Romine, would you read that, please? Yeah, 22 through 27. Okay. If you back up to verse 22. Six day. Gather twice as much. Why? We're introduced to. Sabbath. Word means cessation. Uh, this is going to be a day of rest. Six day. Twice as much will fall. Gather it up. Because. What's happening on the seventh day? Not going to be there. All right, what happened on the seventh day in verse 27? Failed the test again. Failed again. Now we think about what is going on here. 
God is giving them blessings. Any blessing can constitute a test. And they're failing. Now realistically, is he being patient with them? He is being patient. Is he whipping them into shape? Or at least doing things that should whip them into shape. Is he better to them than they are to him? That is obviously true. Now. Question. Does this kind of remind you. Of congregations that we can read about in the New Testament. At all. The Corinthian congregation. People that were kind of. Problematic and griping. And God dealt with them. The Galatians. In Thessalonica. Did they have some problems that had to be confronted? The book of Titus. Did they talk about the Cretans? Uh, the Hebrew letter. You know this sounds harsh. But. We always look down on the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. We don't understand how they could be so silly. But when we stop and think about it, isn't there quite a bit of them in, a, in us? Uh, when, we, when we analyze what is going on, uh, we are a lot more like them than we think sometimes. In verse 31, the house of Israel named it manna, and it was like coriander seed, white, and its taste was like wafers with honey. Okay. There is no right answer on this. When you visualize what manna was and what it tasted like, what do you think of? Oh, a baklava? That's pretty good. I think of Nabisco vanilla wafers. Just have to change the color a little bit. Anybody think of anything else? Crackers without salt. Ah, it's got to be a little sweet. It's got to be a little sweet to be really good with honey. Got to have the honey on there. Uh, point being, was it good? I can eat a baklava. Or vanilla wafer. It was good. And God provided. Now in the 17th chapter. More tests coming up. Uh, and one of them is going to be a real test. First. And this is the funny part again. We started out with water. Turned to food. And now, now what is it? We're back to water. Now we are back to water. Uh, verses 1 through 7 of chapter 17. Ken Simeon, would you read that, please? Chapter Exodus 17, verses 1 through 7.
Okay, we're back to the water again. Now, does the intensity seem to have gone up? In the fourth verse, you notice what Moses says. What shall I do to this people? A little more and they will stone me. They've actually ratcheted up the anger. Why should that be? God has continued to bless them. God provides for them on a daily basis with food. Now they get a little bit thirsty and they've got to have a little water to go with their food. And they're really upset. Why should that be? Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. It shouldn't be. Uh, hey, you're going in the right direction that I'm thinking of. A phenomenon of human behavior. Yeah, that's the way to say it too. Yeah, that's a good way to say it. If, if I know, if I know that you have the power to give me something that I want, uh, Bill has a warehouse full of baklava. I know you could give me a case of baklava. Typical human thinking is what? He's got it. He has it. I'm a friend of his. You should give it to me. If you can give it to me, you should give it to me. Uh, and if you don't give it to me, what am I going to do? I'm going to grumble. I'm going to start complaining because I'm trying to control the situation. If you've ever run a company, um, if the company's prosperous, if they're making money, if you're raking in money, do you tell the employees everything that's going on in the company? Do you tell them about what's coming up as far as bills or insurance or contracts? They only know what? You're making money. And if you're making money, what should you do? You ought to give me some of it. We ought to get a raise. And if I don't get a raise, what am I going to do? I'm going to get all mad and grumble. I think I should be in control. A lot of the grumbling is a control issue because somebody knows this one could furnish it if they would. And I don't understand why they're not. So I'm going to get all upset about it and again try to control the situation. Well, strike the rock, let the people drink. God gave them water. Now, relate that to us just a little bit. Do we know that God can bless us? Does he have the power to furnish us anything that we could ask for? Yeah, the power's there. Well, if he can, he should. If he can, he should. And he should do it now. And if he doesn't, what's the reaction? Grumble. Now, is it truly uncommon for members of the body of Christ to find something to grumble about and deep down in their heart they're kind of mad at God because God should have taken care of this problem for me already? That's kind of like these people. If he can, he should. He ought to be at my beck and call. I'm not going to think about the fact that he sees a situation more clearly than I do. I'm not going to think about the fact that he's got his plans and maybe working in that direction. I want it. I think God should give it to me now. We'll pick up here next week.